you could never beat me. I was yeah. unbeatable. And that was my own um, downfall. Down detriment. Yeah. Is because I'd managed to build up a protection mechanism around me, this force field that was trying to keep me safe, but was actually keeping me broken. Mm. Uh, and it was stopping me from feeling real joy in my life. Hey folks, this week I had a chance to sit down with Andy Fenton, my co-host on Wealth, Wine and Wisdom. Uh, on Fridays we sit down and talk all things property and finance, but this uh, conversation, this podcast, we went deeper into the world of Andy's history of banking internationally, raising billions of dollars, creating products all across Australia, uh, and the high times and the low times, Andy's partner very sadly taking her own life. The, the implosion around the GFC of Andy's life and then him rebuilding his life in the world of finance and helping people all across Australia now in his new business, Fenton Financial, achieve their dreams and take care of their finances and their wealth. What a journey, what a conversation we have gone on today. Uh, for those who are listening in right now, there is some sensitive nature here um, around mental health. If it does trigger you, please reach out to Lifeline, make a call, take care of things. Um, but for those who are going to listen to this episode today, I hope you enjoy and hope there's some lessons in there, uh, good, bad and indifferent, um, that you can take away. Andy Fenton, welcome to the podcast, The Wealth Faculty. Great to have you here today. Mate, good to be here. Wonderful to be here without a glass of wine today. Without a glass of wine. We usually have a bit of a conversation on Fridays, Wealth, Wine and Wisdom. But today, uh, we're going to get... Uh, to dive a little bit deeper with you because uh, I've known you for a few years now and uh, we met at the Kerwin Ray K2 Mastermind, you know, Mastermind Elite program. Uh, for the listeners who haven't met you yet, Andy, uh, can you give us a little bit of a background, a little bit of a snapshot of your history in the world of wealth, banking, financial planning? Give us the kind of like the five minute snapshot of where you started and where we are today, and then we might that give us an overview for our conversation today because I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> it's it's a big question. I mean, the highest level overview is uh, is started off uh, with merchant banking and investment banking uh, here in Australia, uh, offshore London, New York, and then uh, came back to roost uh, and worked most of uh, worked in most states in Australia in various different consulting roles. Uh, and also in distribution uh, and product design as well, as far as financial products are concerned. And then uh, decided to uh, to leave the industry for a number of years and uh, fell back in love with my numbers as an advisor. Strangely enough, one of the things that I'd said I would never become, uh, I became. And it was an unusual twist of events that kind of uh, led me to to be wrong, which just goes to show that I'm wrong all of the time. <laughs> <laughs> what do they say? The more we learn, the more we realise we don't know. Uh, I like, I like that one. And um, so, so just uh, let's talk about this story because it, there's a there's a great conversation to be had here and unpack. So take us back to the days when uh, you uh, started in banking. You were you were quite young, right? Uh, in your early twenties when you entered the world of banking and uh you know you're you're being a little bit coy here but uh, you know banking internationally you know at a very high level really in in the early days you know you were you were top of your game so you know um give us a bit of an idea of how it all started for you mate uh, i know from our conversation your background your dad was in um in the world of finance as well wasn't he yeah, he he was and uh uh, well, it depends on who you ask. He probably still is, <laughs> but uh, uh, certainly he's a counsel for me from time to time, and uh, whether I'm listening or not. But uh, but yeah, he he came from that advisory world. Uh, but you know, I was never going to travel down that that path. As a as a kid right. at school, I played uh, hockey for Victoria and Australia, in uh, right up to under twenty ones. And when I left school, <laughs> uh, as every parent's dream. Uh, I went to uh, music college to to study jazz uh, solo performance, <laughs> which uh, you can imagine. Uh, I think that mum and dad were smiling through slightly gritted teeth, like anything for our boy. <laughs> what have I just done with fucking twelve years <laughs> worth of public school fees or private school fees? But um, uh, 
it, it's funny actually how it transpired because I was super passionate and I was at the top of my game in in music as well and uh, wow. and um, I couldn't eat. I couldn't afford to eat meat. Uh, I was trying to do it as best as I could without any handouts from the government or the family and a jazz musician in Australia doesn't earn very much coin and most of the time uh, I even hitched a ride to a to a gig once with a drum kit because uh, I didn't have enough money to put petrol in the car. And funnily enough, we, we played for pots that night, so I didn't earn any money that night. <laughs> and it, uh, it, it, the story sort of goes that I came back home and, uh, and I reckon I got set up. And uh, the old man had uh, a lamb roast there, which was just, you know, it's like meat, unbelievable. And uh, there was a bottle of 707, uh, Penfold 707. I'm pretty sure it was a Hill of Grace uh, back then. I can't, can't remember exactly because we did drink both of the bottles. And uh, I remember breaking down, having a, a little bit of a cry and going, I don't know what to do with my life. Uh, I've wasted my life. How and old were you at this stage? I, I'm, mate, I, I was just a little bit past 18. So I left school when or I finished school uh, when I was 17. Uh, that was my year 12. And uh, so uh, <laughs> I used to, I think we're past the statute of limitations now. So I used to drive up and back to uh, to university for the f- first three months of, uh, of music college uh, on my L's uh, because uh, <laughs> mum and I'd driven so much with hockey that mum and dad just actually thought that I had my license because I was always driving to and from games every night of the week. And uh, it was a pretty busy little sh- schedule that I had. So uh, yeah, so I drove up and back to music college without a license for uh, a number of years, as you do, and um, and then moved out. But uh, so yeah, just gone eighteen. But he he was my psychology at that point in time. Was I was in tears because I'd wasted a year of my life. All of my friends who uh, who left school and went straight into university, they were a year ahead of me. And that, that was a psyche that I had. Like I'd felt like I'd wasted my life. I'd fallen behind. And like we look back in hindsight and we go, God, how naive is that? Yeah. Uh, but it's interesting because it was one of the things that really spurred me on. Now, I'm pretty sure, and my memory isn't that great, but I'm pretty sure that during that dinner, the old man just all of a sudden said, oh, you're not sure what you want to do with your life? Here's a whole lot of brochures <laughs> on financial courses that you can go and do. Um and uh, and I just picked it up and I went with it and I studied financial markets treasury. So you went and, to university. Uh, so so uh, to crunch this into perspective right now, like you're saying, all right, well, you went to school, you you were you know high level sports, passionate about music, which couldn't be any further from potentially financial <laughs> <laughs> study. And uh, you were you were a, a vegetarian, not from choice, but from budget. Uh, and at some point, you had a conversation with your dad. You know, maybe uh, maybe I could do better with my life, and and uh, he was uh, maybe quite uh, quite strategic about how he sort of encouraged you to take that next step. Well, it it was funny. So there, there's a bloke who might end up seeing this uh, this podcast. His name was uh, Michael Coates, and uh, and he did this same course. He was one of my sister's friends. He did the same course and went overseas to London and just killed the pig. And uh, and he's a very very successful uh, hedge fund manager these days, uh, and a, and a mate who lives just down the road now. He's come back from Hong Kong, uh, but he was the example. So the old man had figured out the story, uh, and he managed to do this course in twelve months. And for most people, it was a two three year course. And I thought, well, fuck this! If he can do it in one year, I'm going to do it in less. So I was trying to do it in in uh, in three out of four. Um, semesters trimester what uh, what's four trimesters whatever semesters um semesters, yeah. so i was trying to do it in three and uh and then just just couldn't quite manage the workload so i got it done within 12 months uh and so i did a little bit of work in the old man's office at that point in time and and crushed this course and as soon as that happened went and started looking for jobs and like every musician who feels like they've wasted their life who all of a sudden had a finance qualification I lied through my teeth on my uh, resume <laughs> and ended up flying up to uh, to Macquarie to join the NAC I think it was called back then and uh, uh, became an investment advisor to financial advisors around Australia so really you know um, maybe uh, that competitive streak came through for you but uh, it's an interesting switch there you know was that um, you know you said that finance or finances were probably the opposite 
of what you wanted to do. Do you think that was a bit of a pushback? You know, you don't want to be like your dad when you're younger. I mean, I, I certainly felt that way uh, with my dad, you know, and many times these days I'm very grateful for the things that he taught me, um, especially um, practical things in my life. But, um, you know, was that something for you as a young man? You were kind of like the anti, anti not be like your parents at that stage and then all of a sudden, you know, practical reality of money pops in because it's a really – and I'll finish that and I'll let you answer because I'll cut you off. But it's a really interesting conversation that you and I in our worlds have often when it comes to money and finances. We, a lot of people tend to choose something to do with money, but it might not necessarily line up with their values or their passions or something like that, or maybe they don't know yet. So anyway, go back to the question, you know, but were, you, were you trying to <laughs> not be done? Uh, look, I reckon it. I reckon it probably was, you know. Don't don't be like your old man. I mean, um, I'm I'm dyslexic, and uh, and I think that that maybe is one of the reasons why. So Tony and I, it's my, my my old man. Uh, we come at a problem from two completely different perspectives. Yeah. Right. I actually, and when he would try and teach me a mathematical equation, or when I was at school, it just it we never connected like that. Like we, his message never got across. We love each other. We've got a great relationship, but when it comes to communication of uh, of concepts, we couldn't jam. Right? We'd get to the same answer, but we would take a completely different route. Do it different. And so maybe there was maybe there was something in that, and maybe that's got to do with the way that my brain is wired and the, and the gift of um, dyslexia that I've got. But um, uh, that could be it, but it, it was pretty simple. I mean, I, I was a muso, right? So things weren't all that complicated. Yeah. It was a matter of, well, people in finance probably have money. I don't have any money. I want I'd like money. to have some money. Yeah. <laughs> it was it was really about as simple as that. And I thought, what, what the hell? I'll just give it a go. But as soon as I jumped into it, uh, it was the treasury side that I really started to enjoy. So uh, I got into bonds and derivatives and where most people really faltered and, f and failed in that area it just seemed to make sense to me and I just absolutely loved it so like the more complicated the better so you know to to maybe explain that or maybe dumb it down to those who are listening and I don't really mean that in a derogative way I mean sort of bring it back to you know language that 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 we can all understand you know derivatives are products or ideas in the financial world that um you know, that are uh, created by very smart people in the world of finance and financial planning and banking, you know, for massive amounts of leverage and other things. You know, it's because it's it fascinates me, um, that world where you can sort of create things sort of out of thin air, uh, very much like um, the, the, the GFC uh, – instruments um there's a there's a famous um uh, it's not wall street it's the um it's the other one with um um leonardo chicago DiCaprio. mercantile exchange yeah <laughs> there's a few of those movies about these leveraged instruments so <laughs> I, just, I just want to sort of rewind up but so, you know, yeah, yeah you know you go from uh, being a muso uh playing for australia in hockey and now uh, arguably at that point in time you were working for macquarie bank uh, macquarie uh, one of the the new kids on the block, like the absolute, maybe the you know the the gem in the in the field of banking, new banking, and uh, that world was pretty crazy and interesting, and going after all sorts of things, wasn't it? Yeah, look, I, I didn't realise what I was in at that point in time. Uh, I was pro, and I have been, I think, through most of my life, one of the most uh, one of the youngest people for my age at any point in time. Mm. Uh, I've always found that it takes me a long time to learn something, but when I get it, it it's it's rock solid. Yeah, uh, and I think it just took me a long time to mature. I mean, I was definitely the black sheep of Macquarie, uh, you know, back <laughs> back then, like, um, and had a pretty big chip on my shoulder. It was like we were doing it Andy's way. And it was always going to be done to Andy's way. Yeah, I think I had uh, three warnings before I even passed my probation. <laughs> Which, but was, um, but, 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 but was that but a culture? For me, things were pretty simple. Yeah, well, but was that a bit of a culture? And we might talk about that as we sort of mature the conversation here. So you know, you, you get into banking, uh, you enjoy it because uh, you're good at it. Uh, you've got a good ego. You've got a competitive streak. You're in a an environment, let's say Macquarie, which technically, you know, rewards that type of behaviour and outcome, you know, it, it, is, is that something that, you know, um, 
really fueled you at that point and you were just really excited about being good at something and 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 excitement was there much thinking about you know what you were creating or what you were doing or anything, anything like that at that point in time oh mate at the, at the, as soon as i started doing the subjects in and around bonds and derivatives i realized that investment banking isn't really a thing in australia because there aren't enough zeros on our balance sheet in yeah. order to have an industry like that yeah and uh so i had this utopian view that i was going to be this hippie musician and so to put this into context i used to have hair down to here which uh, at one point in time was peroxide blonde <coughs> and curly and uh so i and you know i did have a bit of a hippie view of the world you know uh, peace love and mung beans baby was kind of a bit of my philosophy so i had this utopian view that i could get into the invest investment banking world and change the banking world from the right. top down yeah like i said i was pretty naive uh, and, how quick uh, did that view hang around for about five minutes <laughs> Mate, it, it hung around for a while uh, and as life transitioned into sort of higher levels of, of banking and finance, then the soul started to get lost. Uh, yeah, let's do, and let's, what ended let's up change gear into that sort of section then too because this is the fascinating part for me and, and you know, um, thank you for sharing your story today because, you know, uh, the world of money and banking, you know, you know, if people sort of Hollywoodize it, sometimes it can be, you know, an interesting story like the Wolf of Wall Street, uh, you know, that type of idea. But, you know, was there, was there that, um, it's like the, the frog in the boiling water. It's slowly but steadily, like you said, you're exchanging the, you know, the values and the soul stuff for money and success and other things. It, effectively, yeah. Like uh, when I, the, the reason why I was the black sheep at Macquarie is because I wanted to help people. And, uh, and ultimately, you know, if we made a mistake, I just thought, well, we'll fix it. That was my mentality. Again, nothing's ever been that complicated to me. Yeah. It's, it's always a simple solution. But, and so for me, it would be, we'd have these advisors that, you know, had hundreds of millions of dollars with us and they would come in and there'd be a dishonor on a margin loan account or something, which was $35 fee. And they jump up and down because we'd made the mistake. So I'd just be sitting there going, well, okay, yep, we made the mistake. We'll 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 reverse the transaction for you. Don't worry about the dishonor fee of thirty five dollars. Thirty five. Uh, and yep. then I'd get in trouble because what had ha what the normal process was to escalate it through the teams, and the advisor would get pissed off, and and then you'd go up, and the divisional director would eventually sign off and sort of go, why the hell did this come to me? So I just thought, well, let's just <laughs> cut out the middleman, yeah, and uh, and let's just admit it's our fault and just move on and and save thousands of dollars worth of hourly rates and then as i got higher up and and you know more and more zeros on on the balance sheet uh you started losing perspective and it, it was really slow uh because i still had this sort of hippie little view that i was going to change the world but then the competitive side also came out it's like ah wouldn't mind jason's job mm. uh you know what do i need to do to get there and it wasn't necessarily cutthroat in the beginning. It was trying to impress and you're trying to impress your boss, right? And then it was by designing things. And as soon as I was given a, a bit of a leash to be able to start to use my creative uh, brain and start to design things, then things started to accelerate super, super quickly, you know. Design um, financial and, products. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And then it's a matter of as you're doing that, you're getting a lot of recognition as, you, as you're going along. And then sometimes, well, not sometimes, then you'd stop asking yourself whether you should be doing it, but you just did it because you could. Because you and can. so a classic example is, is the, CDOs. It's like- What was, this, what was the size years. of the biggest deal that you put together in, in that sort of space? You know, like we're talking hundreds of millions, right? Like that in, in or, or even bigger. Yeah, look, I, I couldn't tell you the biggest one. I know that uh, as far as capital raises, personally, on my book, it's over a billion that I've raised in total or well yeah. over a billion. Well over a billion uh, dollars, Probably yeah. the, the, the single biggest one I can remember was about $350 million, um, in and that was about a, a four-month four raise. And yeah. so this is another classic example, and I'm not going to say whether it was onshore or offshore um, because I could get into trouble for releasing this information, so I'll have to... Um, protect the guilty, uh, as the they say. Names are changed to protect um, the guilty. Yeah, yeah, that, that's it. So no names, but th this is a scenario. So uh, 
there's a there's a thing called structured products, right? And structured products are complex derivative products. And an example would be that you, Jason, uh, you, Joe, everybody would come out and, and you would uh, you would leverage yourself up a hundred percent to to buy a, an equity vehicle of some sort. So you borrowed a hundred thousand dollars or half a million dollars, let's say, uh, half a million dollars. They guarantee the investment, right? And they guarantee that you'll get the half a million dollars back and you pay the interest from point A and you're locked in for seven or 10 or 15 years. And these things came out just before the GFC. Now, we used to use them in banking to do long-term strategies for bonds to reduce the volatility. And I'm talking, now I'm talking, you know, billions, 10 billion, you know, in that sort of range. And we yeah. would use these strategies to strip out long-term volatility of you know one percent or, or thereabouts they re-engineered these products and then they released them on joe everybody in equities and as we know bond markets don't tend to move as much as equity markets uh, and so what ended up happening is the gfc hit and all of these products became what we call cash locked billions of dollars went into these products and i got involved in designing a product to Give people the opportunity to at least get out of this cash lock. So if it was you, Jace, you've just got half a million dollars. It's on your house. Uh, you've got an equities portfolio that is now what they call cash locked. So you have to pay the interest on that. And back then it was about 7%. Yep. You pay the interest on that right the way through for the next 10 years. It's a pretty bitter pill to take, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so spent some time building a product up with uh, a couple of other people which allowed them to be released, right? Allowed them to be released from that and gave them an opportunity, even though it was a slim opportunity, gave them an opportunity to be able to be mobile in the market again. So if markets were good, they might actually get something back yeah. rather than just have to pay interest for, for seven to 10 years. So this involved uh, a, a, an investment bank and it also involved a bank. And what ended up happening is this product when we got the PDS back, the product disclosure statement back, the bank put in a line fee on the loan and the investment bank put in a performance fee on the underlying investment. And when I crunched the numbers on it, it didn't work. The only people who were going to make money on it was going to be the bank. So um, was, was it was impossible. First, was that the first time you started to take notice of that stuff? What was changing for you now? Like you'd You'd obviously been, I'm assuming you've been in the banking space, in this space for five years or more or, or, or maybe maybe whatever. What, what's starting to change for you now? You're sort of seeing these products and going, hang on, I wonder if people are making money out of it too as, as well as us. What's going on for you? Well, that, that scenario was the end. That, right. that scenario saw me uh, uh, verbally abuse some very, very high-powered people in the industry, which pretty much ended my career. Yeah. Uh, but to me it was it was disgusting you know it, it didn't matter where i was playing in the in the field of of finance uh, i always had a link through dad to to dad's clients and and you know the the normal people so i always had that that connection to mum's dad's joe everybody's and whenever i'd have the conversation that was a really good grounding point and so when this happened and cuz investment banking and corporate finance is different and it's different because you're playing with big money, big dollars, billions of dollars, right, uh, or hundreds of millions of dollars, and you're playing with corporations, right? So, and the one of the games when uh, when we were looking at uh, exotic derivatives was that we were trying to get the risk off the balance sheet of my bank and onto the balance sheet of whoever fucking else, right? Yeah, <laughs> we yeah, didn't yeah. care. Game we just wanted potato. to pass the hot potato. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And and and, and so underneath that, of, yeah, underneath that, obviously, is is you know, if you drill it down further and further, it might end up at sort of often mums and dads' money. But but that's with an institution, then then you know, one or two layers up, you, you're really not knowing or appreciating it's mum and dad's money, right? And and this is this is sort of how it evolved. In that, it was a lot of fun to figure out these complex equations of how to remove risk from balance sheets of banks and and push it onto somebody else, but. We just did it because that was the problem that we wanted to solve. And I've yeah. always loved solving problems. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, you know, as a jazz musician, that's kind of what you do. You improvise in and around, um, you know, basic form. 
Yeah. And in investment banking or sorry, in the exotic derivative side of the equation, that's that's what you were doing as well. You're 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 a free freestyling within a construct in order to achieve a, a result. A result. And it didn't matter whether the end result was good, bad, or indifferent. You, as long as you met your brief, that was it. That's all you had to do. You, got you never stopped to that. ask yourself, is this a good thing? You never stopped to ask yourself, is this a bad thing? You never stopped to ask, who am I hurting or who am I helping? Yeah. Uh, and at the beginning, yes, it did. But after a little while, it became about impressing people. And then eventually uh, got to a stage, and just before I came back to Australia, got to a stage where I was kind of looking at it and I and I zoomed out and asked the question because, you know, we're doing it, but should we be doing it? Should What's the greater doing. impact? Yeah, yeah. And um, and that was the thing which all of a sudden went quite heavy. If, to me, that was the beginning of the end. As soon as I zoomed out and it stopped being a competition about trying to impress or solve problems or do all of those things, which is all about a tiny little team, right? A small little team that you operate in and then you might go up to the next next level. Um, as soon as I zoomed out and started to look at the potential impacts of what, what we were doing and started asking the, the question, should we be doing this? That that was the beginning of the end. And that that brought upon some really, really tough times for me because So mate, uh, let's let's I mean let's um if you don't mind sort of changing gear and talking about that, because this is where you and I have some some very similar experiences in, in in history where you know the gfc the gfc brought home uh brought home some of the the problems the the weaknesses in our decision making processes i know that was for the same for me and, and you've discussed that as well you know the gfc was the 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 death nail for that stuff for you and it was a bit of a knock-on effect from then on um so you know talk us through that process because, um, you know, I know you and I have got a very similar story on two sides of a coin on this one. Oh, man, it was like it, it was – you never saw this coming, right? Never saw it coming, um, although we did see it coming, but yeah, never saw the, the impact. So the thing about the psychology before we jump into what actually happened – is when you start to realise that something that you have prided yourself over, let's say, five years now, and and by the by, my the chip on my shoulder was so big that that I wanted to be Dr. Fenton. So mm -hmm. I didn't stop studying after the first 12 months. I studied every single year of my life until I was 30. I never stopped studying. So I basically full-time studied while doing full-time careers every year of my life. Mm -hmm. And that was purely because I just... I felt like I wasn't good enough and I felt like I needed to more credentials, but I needed to be better, you know, to, to the point, which we'll probably chat about another time. Um, you know, on, on the day after I got married, um, I was actually sitting an exam uh, over, over, over the other side of the world. But so you put all of this effort in and you put all of this inertia in and, and then all of a sudden you look at it and you're going, actually, what I'm doing, I don't think is a good thing. What I'm doing, I'm not sure is actually contributing to people's lives. It's actually detracting from people's lives potentially. Yeah. What I'm doing is potentially building things that may actually kill people. Mm. Um, and so all of a sudden that that led down a very, very, it's a, it was a sort of a five-year transitional period, I think, where, where I really started to not realize that I hated what I was doing, but I, I fundamentally started drinking more. I was less happy. So the the wheel started falling off at this stage, but I wasn't right. conscious of it. It just slowly happened because that, that, I that knew voice in the, that voice in the back of your mind, that subconscious knows, and then you're sort of starting to mask these things with you know alcohol, drugs, you know party, and other distractions. You know, and it, yeah, yeah, it's it's um, unfortunately a very common thing. And so you know, so that was just that was prior to the GFC, and 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 um, you know the wheels came off around the GFC on one of. You know those products that you were building, and and um, you it was a quite on multiple, a bit, yeah, yeah, on multiple. Yeah. So when I came back to to Australia, I did some co consulting work in building products. Mm. Uh, also worked uh, with a distribution business over a period of time, and a few uh, independents. And again, I'm not going to mention the names of them, but um, uh, one company that I worked for it was 
uh, was very, very closely involved in building the products uh, and then also distributing them because nobody knew. And this was this was at a time where you know the government came out with all of these initiatives. Uh, the 2020 vision uh, the government came out with, which was Green Australia by 2020. Well, we're here and it didn't fucking work. Mm. Uh, and typical form, the government implemented these massive concessions across the agribusiness sector at that point in time. And uh, and then as they do, they drop the legislation, then they turn their back on it and just expect it to work out. And of course, the bankers get involved, right? So then the Collins Street bankers, uh, sorry, the Collins Street agricultural uh, train started to really build up some momentum. And so we had trees, we had uh, you know, ostriches, we had everything. And uh, and it was based on some very, very heavy tax stimulus uh, advantages that, that were brought out. And so I got involved with a number of companies like that, helping them design com- uh, design the products and design yep. the tax structure around it. Yep. One of them, I was very close to the raising and uh, there was a bit of dodgy stuff, I think, that happened at the at the top level where the research that the research reports that were given to you know the investors of the world and also the research reports that were given to us um, didn't necessarily have the up and up information in there, if you will. And it's only when you look back, and I remember this person, uh, and I I remember this feeling every time I met them that I just felt nervous. Mm. I just felt nervous, and I thought it was an admiration thing. I thought it was like, wow, you're really cool, and I'm nervous because I'd like to be like you. Later on, I realized that it was actually a warning signal, uh, and now I've, I've learned to embrace that as a warning signal ever since then. When I start to feel that feeling, uh, I go in and try and understand whether it's my own internal nerves, but for me, it's a bit of a warning sign. Take notes. And in hindsight, every time we were meant to go to these specific plantations, something happened last minute. An urgent meeting came up. Something, and it wasn't until years later that you put the pieces back together. But basically, uh, you know, three hundred and forty million dollars worth of mums and dads' money evaporated overnight. Right. Um, and I was on the front line of it, and and a huge amount of mine too. You know, I lost significant amounts of money in yeah. that and um, so because I believed. Like- yeah, and so you were a believer. You helped design that sort of stuff, and you know, um, like how low did it go for you at that point? Like, I mean, you know, was that was that the sort of the the full point really of the beginning? Which you know, you th- you, you look back and go, wow, you know, there was there was a, a gazillion notices before, but I was either masking them or I was not paying attention, or like you said, you thought it was something else. You know, three hundred plus million dollars of other people's money, and I'm sure many million dollars of yours. Um, you know, was that was that a, that was that the lowest point? You know, where, where, how did how low did that, it get? That was only just getting started. Uh, so that so the GFC brought that down. Um, of the sector which I consulted to, uh, thankfully, just to assist in the product design, mm. uh, there's only three players I think that are still around today, uh, and uh, in a very very different form. Yeah. So. That whole sector got wiped out. We're talking billions now. We're talking, I think, 3.4, 3.8 billion, somewhere around that number. Yeah. Bang, gone. That's mums and dads too, mostly mums and dads. Um, the structured product industry, now, I wasn't, I didn't make these products, but then the, the lowest point was the story that I told before. But the structured products, bang, gone. Billions of dollars wiped out of Australia. Um and, uh, and then the lowest point was really when I, I, I realized that I could design something to fix the problem and I could be a part of being able to bring life back to something that was dead and then just got fucked. I absolutely got gag orders, got, got screwed left, right and center, basically on a product that should never have been launched. It was never going to work. Uh, anybody who could do significant enough analysis on it which very few people could yeah. would understand it yeah and yeah. when that happened uh that was when i realized like i i can't work here you can't be in this uh, industry. i can't work in this industry like this 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 is fundamentally it's a broken world like the, it, there's nowhere i can go and i just felt i can i felt like i completely failed across all levels yeah what the one thing that i was very proud about uh, you know, later on down the track. And there are a number of people that were great mentors for, of mine at that point in time who, you know, even said to me, you know, it, it wouldn't be a bad thing if, if you just, if, if you decided to 
just go away for a little period of time. You know, if, if you feel like you can't handle it, just spend some time out of the game. Yeah, right. uh, but that wasn't me. So I nursed all of the investors through the project that I was very closely associated, every single one of them right the way through. Um, and that took about three years while I was working in a different job. So you, uh, so but you, you got out of every that industry. Single one of them. Yeah, you got out of that industry and um, you uh, you personally, you know, connected with all of those investors and helped them throughout the other side of it. And to, you know, to your, your credit and, and I'm sure – to the emotional and mental detriment um, for other bits in your life as well. Uh, it was brutal, but it yeah. was the only honourable thing to do because yeah. uh, nobody else was going to do it. Uh, everyone else ran for the hills. Everyone just went to uh, cover their own asses, and yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, this again was that 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 second nudge where you're going. You know what? I've spent my life becoming an expert and an authority, and. Um, multiple degrees and masters and 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 I'm not sure that I can continue to play here. Yeah. Um, and so you know that decimation. Then there was West Point and uh, look, <laughs> I knew all of the everyone I'd always I'd hung around for about four to five years. <laughs> Actually, you know what? I'm not sure if I can use the name on this, but somebody I considered to be you know a good mate who was at a lot of different conferences that I'd go to ended up being the Bertie Madoff of, of Australia um, and just was – it was a complete and utter Ponzi scheme. Yeah. And, you know, I never invested with him. They'd offered me a job, but I never did any work with them. Uh, but I'd had quite a few beers at the bar and I'm like, I, I, I just don't know anymore. Like, I'm not sure. I can't trust anybody. The people that I do trust are, are potentially corrupt. Like yeah. where do you go to actually get anywhere in this world or is this world just completely toxic? Is, is this what uh, it is? Yeah. And so you find yourself And the you financial system here. was fundamentally broken. broken. Like it was fundamentally broken. Yeah. Uh, it really was. In Australia and overseas, it was just, it was, things needed to change. Mate, and you know, you know, at this point, you, you, how many years are you in, into, into the world of finances? Ten years, ten years, a decade, years. And, yeah. and I, f I felt like it was a lifetime. I felt really like did. A lifetime. It's, uh, and so, would it, would it be fair to say at yeah. this point, your say, your your view of the world might have been pretty dark about humanity and and this world that you thought was you know, pretty exciting and amazing and potentially even maybe looked up to because your dad was in that industry forever and a day too. You know, was did that did you just, you know, completely question everything about the world at that point and your, your whole life? I mean, I, I certainly felt the same way with a similar experience after the GFC for me. I felt like I'd been, my whole world had been ripped out violently from the roots and I had no roots anywhere. I didn't know where I belonged. How did, where were you at that point? Just lost, I think. You know, it, yeah. And and there were, there were other things at, at play at that point in time that um, that were a very very tough. Uh, there are other things that were happening in my life that were making the situation extraordinarily uh, difficult or just a lot worse. Yeah. Uh, but it was just a matter of that you did what you did because you didn't know what to do, um, and trying to find some value and trying to find uh, a stance where you feel like you're contributing back to people's lives. Yeah. And um, and I sort of found little areas of, of where I could operate like that. But, uh, but yeah, I, and again, it wasn't conscious. So this stuff is only conscious in, in, in hindsight. When you look back, you can yeah. see what's happened. Yeah. When yeah. you're in there, you're still battling, right? Yeah. And, and so when I talk about being lost, I didn't know I was lost. Yes. I just thought I was just evolving the way that I was evolving, which was not good. You know, it was, yeah. I was starting to become, you know, highly stressed uh, often, uh, wasn't enjoying life, wasn't finding, uh, you know, much pleasure in life yep. uh, on the weekends or anything like that. Um, I'd started isolating myself a lot from my friends. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if you look back, you go, well, was it a self worth thing? Uh, was it an arrogance thing? Uh, was it I was just trying to build something? Uh, it, I don't actually fully know. It's but when I was there, it was it was challenging, and challenging. The, it was at that at that point in time where I uh, so coming back from New York, I'd met uh, I'd met uh, Angela soon to become my wife, and 
uh, she moved out to Australia and we had a place in, in St Kilda Road and and that was while all of this turmoil was going on. And so, you know, I pr promised this person, uh, you know, who I loved that I would bring them the world and the world around me just started crumbling uh, and, like and no tomorrow. she moved from the UK or the US? Uh, UK. UK. Yeah, yep. moved over from the UK. So she landed um, here, so you guys got married and it was four or five years of just well, not even that long, you know. It wasn't long until uh, she started to, to become depressed and, I mean, clinically depressed. And so I was spent my time going to, going to a job facing these challenges, uh, left, right and centre, and coming home to somebody who went through long periods, long pro prolonged periods of time yeah. uh, of sort of self-isolation in, in our unit and... Um, you know, for those people who have seen depression uh, at that sort of level, uh, understand what I'm talking about. But very few people get it. Yeah. Right? Very few people understand depression. And I had that mindset as well at that point in time. It's like I still had that utopian, naive kid about me. That I mean, I, I could do anything. I could make anybody's life amazing. Any, um, life even though my up. life was 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 going down the shit. Um, I still had this positive disposition. Um, it was nowhere near where I used to be. But but, but at that uh, point, I, you were still you were still saying to yourself, "Oh no, I can fix this. I can do this." Like, I'm, yeah, 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 yeah. But probably, as you know, mate, you you put on this false facade and you lose your soul. Yes, uh, and so it, in, and it manifests that, that in you, different yeah, ways. Different ways. So so at this point, you, you you feel like, well, maybe not in the in that moment. You're saying, okay, but you know, looking back, you say, well, gee, you know, I, I'd traded my values, my soul, you know. Um, my trust, you know, like, you know, how can I fix this all up? And then, you know, um, uh, ultimately it became even more um, dysfunctional and worse for you um, in the next little while too. Like it wasn't the end until, you know, or there wasn't a change until, you know, something else for you as well. Mm. Um, yeah, uh, it, it, it all seems like a bit of a blur uh, yeah. when you look back at it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it also, you know, that that also gave a different perspective as well, which was a really good perspective. And I, I know I'm painting it kind of black at the moment, but there was – when you've got somebody that you love that goes through such pain so frequently um, and just gets numb to the world, then what happens is when they're good – you you don't lose a moment, right? Because you know what it is to be at the darkest of dark. So as soon as you see the light, you know you're. It's it's all about enjoyment. It's all about living in the moment. It's all about uh, bringing joy to that moment, knowing that the the basic most uh, that 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 basic very very simple thing that's happiness mm. can be so fleeting. That as soon as you start to get the opportunity to get there, then the world disappears around you, and you're you become extraordinarily pre present to that moment. But the problem was then is that those moments become less and less and less over time. And uh, you know, I remember trying to fix things. You know, using that sort of "I can fix it" mentality for many for for longer than I can remember, and it got to a stage where I just, I had no more tools left. And uh, so we went and and she was on antidepressants for a period of time. And it was, she when she had them, things were good. You know, they were just, they were, for me, they were good until I heard this comment because she was on them and off them and on them and off them. And so she used to relate it to having oil in my veins. That was that was the way that she used to describe it. She feels like I feel like I've got oil pumping through my black veins. I feel like it's black. And um, and when she took the the antidepressants, then what happened is that that lifted. But she not only didn't feel the depths of despair that she was in, she didn't feel anything. And the comment was, you know, I'd rather live a life of misery to be able to love you for one moment than live a life feeling nothing. Yeah. Because when I'm on them, I don't love you. I don't love anything. I can't cry. I can't be happy. Uh, and when I heard that, I'm like, I get it. Like, I, I actually get that. Mm -hmm. Like, I couldn't live that life either. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and so then you know becomes the big conundrum of well this is this is going to be our life then you know this is going to be our life it's going to be miserable and terrible and horrible for 80 percent of it and when the 20 percent comes around you embrace that moment like there's no tomorrow mm. um you know and and that was that was probably about three years we we sort of spent in that in that space uh and that's why while all of this stuff was going on um around the scenes at the same time mm. it uh, a big uh, a big moment in in life for you and and um uh probably at that point like you're saying like the tools that you had you know or didn't have you know looking back on it now you know potentially you know 10 years later or whatever the time frame is that um you know it's easy to solve things in hindsight but not necessarily in the moment mm. yeah absolutely yeah, yeah yeah and mate you know for you um i know that there was you know um a a, a personal tragedy at at this point, you know, you and I have chatted about this once or twice before, and you're, you're happy to share because it's part of your story. And 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 um, you know, um, um, you know, my uh, my experience is not the same, but I've got some similar stories. That's why I think we sort of get on reasonably well in in our worlds of you know experiences. You're telling me your story about you know, uh, you know, eighteen, always being the youngest, all sorts of stuff. We've got these sort of linear moments in time, but um, you know. I had a uh, a cousin uh, do business with me, failed business. We failed the business together. He took it very hard, and he, he took his own life. And you know, and that's where you know potentially some of our stories are very similar with with Angel and you. You know, um, mate. You know, after that moment in time, you know, obviously there's just no words to describe those sorts of things. But mate, you know, let's fast forward a little bit from that stuff and not stay in that moment. But you know. I think the the hero story about this, which I admire a lot about you, is, you know, after um, those experiences, you know, how you've rebuilt your life um, based on values and focus and helping and stuff like that. So how did that start again? How did you, where did you go to to put yourself back together? How did it start for you? Like, you know, for someone listening in who might have, might have had a similar experience right now, we can help them in that way. What was it for you? You know, sort of could be people could listen in to that'd be the worst thing ever. Um, and then, you know, where did it start for you? How did you start to put your life back together? Well, it started from the moment that it was all stripped away. Yeah. Uh, you know, so without staying in that, without, without sort of sitting in this moment, but the, the, the time that I found that uh, Angel had passed was I was at work. Two police officers came to the uh, to the to the door uh, and took me around the back, and I'm thinking, Fuck, "What have I fucking done now?" <laughs> There's a million and one things that could have could they could have been there for, um, and and I, I can remember it vividly. I can remember seeing their faces and seeing the pain and 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 the way that they were, and they sat me down and they they basically said, "Look, um, this morning we found found your wife on the bed. She'd taken her life. We need you to come and identify," and the reason why I talk about this at that point is I've never been in a position ever where I've totally lost control of my body. Uh, you know, I used to skydive. Uh, you know, whenever something scared me, I would do it until it never scared. It didn't scare me anymore, and then I'd do it so well that I, I was, you know, at a very high level at, at it. Uh, and I just, I just spontaneously combust. Like I just, I couldn't, I couldn't regulate. I couldn't stop shaking. I couldn't stop anything i couldn't even process the information that that was landing on me like it, it, it just completely destroyed me into to nothing and i spent i reckon probably an hour just in that state not able to move not able to talk not able to stop shaking uh and then spent a week you know uh you know probably under a bottle uh and just not able to process anything uh you know i, I became useless to the world for that period of time mm. And after that week, uh, people started falling uh, down around me. Like people were, I, were dropping like flies left, right and centre. And I, my job was then to console them in their position. So very, very quickly I went from being 
you know, in mourning to then having to protect everybody around me. And so the reason why I say that is because then what that did is it brought zero consciousness to what had actually happened for a number of years into the future. And so it was at that stage, though, that I made a promise to myself that I was never, ever going to do anything that didn't bring joy to my life. Like if if you've got somebody that you love who whose life is taken away even at their own hands, it, it has an effect on you which which is, you know, I, I, the words don't even express it, right? Yeah, um, yeah. But it, for me, it made me feel like I, it was my duty to live a good life. It was my duty to live a life that was feel, filled with joy. Uh, it was my duty to live a good life. And I didn't know how to do that because I was miserable for, you know, those years beforehand. Um, before, yeah. And so I quit. I was, that, I was like, it can't be in the finance industry. So I quit. I got completely out of it. Um, and some months later, when I was starting to, to, to feel capable again, I, I went and sat on a beach in Thailand, uh, in Caron in the off season. I said, I'm not getting off this beach until I know what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. And, uh, I almost became a scuba dive instructor. I was this close. I was, I was registered in the course. I was doing all of the dives. Can you imagine it, mate? Can you imagine me being a scuba dive instructor down in, uh, in Thailand somewhere? I, I can I because can. I was I was almost a climbing instructor in a very exactly the same manner. <laughs> and uh, so here's where the, the the irony kind of creeps in is that my sister Ange gave me the this book The Wolf of Wall Street and uh, and I started reading it and I, I look I was a, it was a funny book and I'd been in that industry I'd yeah. seen been part of the drugs the sex the rock and roll the full box and dice like it's all true. Uh, maybe not to the level of Jordan, like he was sort of next level. But this book fascinated me from a perspective of, I, I'm like, I've been in this industry, but I didn't do what you did. What does it take to build a business that fast, that well, and to, the, to that size? Like, yeah. And then these things started going off in my head, like, well, if I could run my own shop, then I could do things the right way. I tried to change the finance world from the top down, but maybe – that's not the way. Maybe I change it from the ground up. From the ground up. And but so I became fascinated by Jordan for this period of time. And my sister gave me a call while I was sitting on the book uh, beach and I'd just finished the second book. Uh, people must have thought I was crazy. I'm just lying by myself on a beach and bursting out laughing every now and again and people <laughs> would be looking around. And uh, and so I anyway, she said, uh, Andy, uh, like, what, what's going on? She said, well, that guy Jordan, he's coming to to – uh, to Australia. I said, when? She's gone next week. And I'm like, oh, shit. And, and there's a job on Facebook that you can apply for to, you know, and I'm like, okay, I'm in, I'm flying back. So the idea of sitting on the beach, trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life, you can start to see how impulsive I was at that <laughs> point in time. And so I jumped on a plane and I came back and uh, anyway, long story short, uh, I, I met Jordan, started doing some work with him because uh, he was doing sales training at that point in this time. This is well after the Wolf of Wall Street era, yeah. This is well uh, And so he was preaching a story of a reformed person and I got that, right, because I'd been there and that was what I wanted to be. I wanted to be reformed. I wanted to believe that there were things that I, the talents that I had and the skills that I had, I wanted to believe that I could actually deploy these things for good. So his story just resonated straight away with me. He had me hook, line and sinker. Yeah. Now, this, I'm not going to comment on whether Jordan's a, a person of good scruples or not. But, you know, I believed, I, I fundamentally believed. And whether you like him or, or don't like him and think he's a crook or whatever the case may be, to me, I'm not here to judge him. That's not my gig. But what it did is it gave, he gave me the, the confidence uh, to actually start to think, well, I can actually build up my own business. Yep. I can create my own destiny. Um, I'm shit at having bosses because I've argued and I've got warnings from every single boss I had from Macquarie. Like I said, I had three warnings before I'd passed my three-month probation. I think I had four before I even passed my probation. And, uh, and, that, and that was my career. Like I was always in cahoots with my boss, always, because I always had a better way of doing it. Yeah. And, um, and it was. Like I, I, I did have talents in these areas and there were better ways of doing it. And quite often the reason why I got, you know, quite high up quite quickly is because 
I told them, and if they didn't believe it, then I told their boss, <laughs> and they got pushed out of the way, and I took and then, their job. And when, so, yeah, when you proved it, then you got their job. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's kind of how I caught, climbed the corporate ladder. But Jordan gave me a, a, an internal belief or maybe a structure or a form uh, or a confidence to be able to go out and design my own business. And here's the thing is that ex-investment banker, ex-corporate uh, finance guy, dealt with billion dollar deals hundreds of millions of dollars all the time i'm like i'm sitting there going how hard can this shit be this has got to like i mean this is going to be easy you know i've done it at the top why can't i just (laughs) you know create a small business and just smash it out and so this is this is the uh this is the mentality that i went in with and uh i started a a kite surfing tour company taking people to venezuela that was my first bit business it wasn't in finance it was it was in the kite surfing world oh yeah 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 well i know i was finance was dead to me there was so much trauma associated with finance for me that uh that i couldn't ever think about going back like it 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 really the death of my wife uh the the alcoholism you know the 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 hundreds of conversations with people who had lost so much in in some of those ventures and mind you there was some great stuff as well i mean we made a lot of money for a lot of people yeah uh but at the end around the gfc it there was just it was no i couldn't fathom it like there was no way i was in in the wrong way it was in the negative for you yeah 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 but i did have a a great skill set because i'd seen thousands inside thousands of advisory practice Gotcha. Uh, advisory practices around the world, yeah. thousands of accounting businesses around the world, and thousands of mortgage breaking businesses around the world. I my my I always kept the business cards of everybody who I'd ever met, uh-huh. and I had four thousand contacts. And so then, when I started thinking, uh, uh, I, I started thinking, well, they all ran shit businesses. So like, and on, I remember on, thinking, you're, you're, it, you're, you're, you're surf, you're kite surfing, and and now you're going well. This is fun, but it's not making me any money. Are, are you come full circle again at this point? Is this where? No, no, I was doing no. them both at the same time. Like I was just like, I can take on the world. I can, I can do it all, <laughs> mate. This, I, at this point in time, I was working from about uh, four thirty in the morning till about eight or nine o'clock at night every single day from my bedroom. I would get up, I'd go for a run, I'd hit the computer. Um, so got to the stage that was when I got introduced to Apple computers, and it was by Kerwin right. actually, Kerwin Ray. And there was a comment that he said, and he never he will never realise how profound it was. Uh, he said, "The reason why I have apples is because apples don't crash." And as soon as I heard that, I'm like, "I'm getting a fucking apple," yeah. because every time my computer got the blue screen of death, that was two, three, four days out of work for me, and I didn't know what to do with myself with three, two, three. I like because I, I was just going bullet a gate, so I got an apple. And I was working ridiculous hours. I did everything from uh, learnt internet design, learnt uh, learnt uh, marketing tactics from Jordan and from people who were around his course, learnt SEO, learnt, I learnt every learnt NLP. Uh, I'd, I'd done a lot of psychology study before because yep. of, of the time that I'd spent with Angel trying to be able to chat with her where she was at. Uh, but I just went, I started studying again, all right? But this time it wasn't in it. finance. Yeah. And sunk then, it in and uh it was it was it was a wild ride and i, I mate, i talk about curb your enthusiasm there was no curbing my enthusiasm i had a new zest for life i had i was uh i was just unleashed on this world and i had these massive expectations and this thirst for knowledge and learning stuff and uh and threw myself into it and then with this uh book of clients that i had i, I thought maybe given the fact that I never really respected a lot of the people that I'd, I'd worked with over the period of time in that uh, advice accounting broking world. Yeah. And, uh, and if you're listening to this podcast, you were the exception. Um, but uh, I didn't have a great deal of respect for their businesses because I thought that their business models were a bit broken. Uh, you know, this commission kind of world and, and all of this stuff, I just didn't believe in it right from the beginning. And I kind of thought, well, maybe I've got an opportunity where I can go in because we part of mergers and acquisitions, which was a part of our career, was deconstructing businesses and reconstructing them yeah. uh, at a very, very high level. And I thought, well, maybe I'll build a business around this. And so we did. We built the marketing engine room and that was service. So then we started internet marketing. So this was 10 years ago, I think, roughly. So we were internet marketing 10 years ago, selling from webinars, advisors, accountants, and brokers uh, into a marketing course. And the reason why it was a marketing course is, 
because they wanted marketing, but what they needed was business structure. Mm. And by bringing them business structure, they got more leads. They got more leads. So, 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 and they didn't so, even know it. They didn't even know it. So tell us, come to the point where where you come to the realization. Was it a was it a big realization, or was it slow that you wanted to get back into the financial industry and do it better this time and build it on values rather than the his the history? What what was the point for you? It was a. It was a complete coincidence. Right. I'd love to tell you that there was this 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 moment where all of a sudden my 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 psychology aligned, the world gave well, maybe the world gave me the avenue, but the the avenue is quite simply this. My my old man had been working in the in the advice world for, for many, many years. Um, and you know, I hope he doesn't mind me saying this, but his best mate came back into his life and took him for an absolute mozza. Just he was a he was a con man. Mm. Um, and in the, the stages where Tony should be getting ready to retire, he had a substantial part of his wealth ripped away by somebody he trusted. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, at that point in time, he sort of reached out for help and, you know, can you, can you help us out? And so you know, there, were, there were different types of dynamics and I'm not used to having bosses and things like that. And I sort of said, look, if I'm going to come in and give you a hand, because I was helping other advisory businesses, yeah. if I'm going to come in and give you a hand, I'm just going to do it, right? And it's it's there's no argument because we can't communicate with each other about concepts because we don't communicate the same way. Yeah. And so the only way we were going to be able to live with each other is to for me to be the boss and 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 respect his position and his knowledge, but for me to make the decisions and him to be the talent, if you will. Um and so he agreed, and that sort of shows ha- the character of my old man. You know that that is got to be one of the toughest things to do is to allow you, your son to come in and run things when you have got the experience, uh, but obviously trusted me. Uh, and from that perspective, he's a far better man than I'll ever be. Maybe, I don't maybe, think maybe that was part of his long term plan, Andy. Maybe maybe maybe, <laughs> maybe the plan worked out in the end. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe. Well, you know, he did set me up right from the beginning, didn't he? Bloody yeah, lamb yeah. roast and a bottle of seven oh seven. He knew how to. He knew Was how to over make another me... lamb roast and a bottle of wine this time. <laughs> <laughs> well, mate, there's been a few, but the <laughs> business was getting tough. Yeah, the business was getting really tough. There was all of this legislation that was dropping post the GFC, mm. and as governments do, they come in late and they overhaul and they bring in just the most ridiculous types of. Uh, processes, laws, restriction, and so this was at a time a where era, my dad, right? yeah, totally new era, new era, the, the, the yeah. compliance era, yeah, right, yeah. and they just put the hammer down and they changed the industry massively after that, and it did need changing. It's just the government don't do a good job of yeah. of changing industries. I, I, I think they we really could don't. talk about. <laughs> I think we could talk about this one for hours with our, in our two industries, but you know, it, mate, I, I could waffle on for years on it uh, because I've lived. <laughs> Lived yeah. through so many different changes of regime, and let me tell you, it's not any better. Not any it was better. like Kerry Packer said back in the day. You know, people won't work in Australia. Large companies say we can't work with you. This idea of changing legislation, 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 making it harder, they, and harder. You don't know where you're going to be, so they're not going to spend billions of dollars in here. And he said, "Well, I've I've got a suggestion for you. Why don't?" Every time you put new legislation in place, you repeal you part of the old, old one. one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and arguably, arguably, you know, um, and we won't sort of dive down this little rabbit hole, but arguably, <laughs> uh, arguably, it's made the smaller, more boutique, more personalised firms um, absolutely too much high risk and high cost to run anyway. So I believe the value, the the overall value of of the industry is, has been diminished because it pushes out small boutique players. Who who don't want to have you know fifty people and, and a gazillion dollars a year in compliance costs because that just that adds no value to their yeah. clients. So so mate, um, let, let's sort of you know let's let's sort of have a talk about the now. Uh, so you uh, now run a very successful um, planning firm, fin- uh, Fenton Financial. Um, you know, and sprung from the from the loins of your your father's. Um, <laughs> father's doing maybe, um, and um, you know you you work with, you know, uh, high net worth clients now, um, a, a very successful business owners, high net worth clients, 
you know, you and I have lots of conversations around, you know, property and shares and and um, all sorts of conversations in and around wealth. Um, but you know, this podcast is called the Wealth Faculty, uh, and I know you've got some great practices now. The Wealth Faculty is a play on two styles of um, thoughts. Here is like the faculty you bring to life, yours. You know, your physical, mental, emotional. You know, um, you know, faculties, and also the faculty of people you surround yourself. Let, let me ask you the question. You know, for everyone listening in right now. How do you take care of yourself now? How do you nourish those faculties in this world now, your personal faculties, you know, um, um, these days? I mean, that that's the learning curve, right, is that, mm. um, you know, that you talked previously about that point of consciousness uh, yeah. that that and when did that happen? Uh, and it happened shortly after I found the, the, the business, the finance business, right? Mm. So got into Help Dad, then realised... He he didn't turn up one day, and and now you got me thinking, Jace. Maybe this was his plan all along. <laughs> so he he didn't turn up one day, and and I saw a client on his behalf, and she that she came in, and then she walked out in tears because we I just completely revolutionised what her life was going to look like, just completely changed it for the better. Mm. Um, so she came in broken, she went out fixed. That was the first time I ever remember just going wow. Uh, and for me, it was like the really, really simple stuff. So yeah. that was when I committed. I'm like, I'm going to do this for a year. And if I still like it in a year's time, I'm going to do it for another year. And if I still like it, then I'm going to do it another year. And I'm going to keep doing this until this business tells me what I really love, which is a weird way of looking at it, right? But I just knew I loved it, but I knew that I had to learn and the business would tell me. Mm. But there was always this part of, of feeling slightly broken, Uh and I was always looking for a mentor. I was always looking for a business partner. I was always looking for somebody to fix this thing that was inside me that just felt dark and broken. Right. Um, and I, I was a fun-loving character. I always have. I've, I've always been kind of like this. Like you let me out of my shell. I'm I'm wild. Um, and and I, I love it. But I'm also a very insular person as well. When when I'm not. But there was this this darkness that sat there. And and I I'd met Magda, who I'm engaged to now. And I just couldn't commit. And I remember sitting at one point in time and I'd kicked her out of my house and I, I, I drew a line down a page and I went, um, reasons to stay together, reasons to break up. The reasons to stay together was pages. And then when I got to the next one, I'm like, okay, now let's go. I could, I, there wasn't a single thing and I just kept on kicking this person out of my life. So I was, despite... I was successful despite myself, but I was fundamentally broke. There was something really wrong with me. And and I think that a lot of this went, well, not think, I know that a lot of it went back to not dealing with, with Angel's death at that point mm. in time mm. and other things that happened. So the the coincidence kind of was I'd spent all this time trying to find a business coach, but I kind of knew one all along. And and we both know him, Kerwin Ray, and, yeah. and I reached out and I found him. Uh and so that that kind of spiritual guru mixed with uh, business skills, and that was exactly what I needed. I needed somebody to help fix me internally, yeah. or at least give me some tools and some consciousness around it. Tools and permission, uh, maybe, and, yeah, yeah, uh, and and maybe some tough love at times to yeah. to kind of to break down because you've got to also understand I'm, I'm a smart dude. I've got, I had the, the investment banking kind of chip on the shoulder. So you came at me with, you know, uh, you come at me with a freight train. I come at you with a planet. <laughs> you come at me with a planet. I come at you with a solar system. You know, it's, you could never beat me. I was yeah. unbeatable. And that was my own um, downfall. Down detriment. Yeah. Is because I'd managed to build up a protection mechanism around me, this force field that was trying to keep me safe, but was actually keeping me broken, mm. uh, and it was stopping me from feeling real joy in my life. And literally, you know, happy things could happen. And I'm not sure if you've ever experienced this, but you're in a moment and you've done something great, and everyone's like laughing and happy, like a Christmas day. And you're just existing in the moment and you want to feel the joy. You want to feel the, the happiness, but you can't feel it. Mm. And, and I remember thinking back at one point in time, I, rem I remember going, well, that must be what it feels like to be on antidepressants. You know, 
there was no hype. My my life had been so volatile, I'd somehow managed to condense it to a flat line. To neutralize but flat line's it, death. Not feel anything. Right? Yeah. yeah. And so then getting coaches and, and here's the thing, came into to Kerwin's world to be coached, to be fixed, but I came in with this force field uh, around me and they did their best to try and come in and give me the tools. And here's the thing. I said, you know what? I think that you're all full of shit. This hippie shit, this work, this vulnerability crap, it's all a bunch of horse shit. You're all fucking hippies. You're all broken. You're all just a bit fucked in the head. But I know that I'm fucked in the head. So I'm just going to do it and I'm going to prove you wrong. Uh, I'm going to take the tools. I'm going to deploy them. And then I'm going to come back and tell you you're all full of it. Um, but a funny thing happened is that I took the tools and I started to be able to, to utilize them uh, and I saw change. And the, after the first year, because this isn't a cheap course, right? You know, we're talking significant, ten, like $50,000, $60,000 a year. So it's not cheap. And I remember at the end of the first year, I'd enjoyed, I'd learned a lot. I still thought everyone was full of it. And I said to Magda at the time, I said, said uh, I'm not sure that I'm going to go back. I need to deploy what I've learned. She's gone, how much is it? And I'd, I'd forgotten. Let's say it's 40 grand or something. And she's gone, I'll pay for it. You're going back. <laughs> and and I said, that's why. Like that's a, it just, it floored me. I never expected to hear that. And I was like, why? And she's gone, you've changed. Mm. You've, you've fundamentally changed. Our relationship is better you're happier. And then when I started to reflect, I'm like, actually, I have felt periods of times of happiness. And yeah. so Magda's and my relationship is a weird one because the first year was the toughest. Our honeymoon has been the rest of our life together. Mm -hmm. um, once, once I got past my stuff. And so I've never stopped learning on that ever since. And so now, you know, my faculties, as you call them, become extraordinarily robust routines um, in and around meditation, in and around mantras, in and around journaling. Um, every single morning uh, I get up and it, it's, it's, it's an evolutionary process. Yeah, it's like every time I learn something more, yeah. Yeah. I bring it in and I try it in my life and then six months down the track, if I feel better, it stays. If I don't feel like it or if it just if it's not quite working, it goes. But like to give you an example, the morning, so I wake up uh, around about 5.30 in the morning, get up, rain, hail or shine, I take off my shoes, I go outside, I stand on the grass for five minutes. I put my timer on, five minutes. I don't look at my phone other than to put my timer on. Um, as When that five minutes is fi finished, jump straight inside, straight into the, to the gym and I, I do exactly the same routine every single day. I blow up my shoulders but I just get into the gym every single morning. Uh, when that, as, as I'm doing that, I'm listening to Bloomberg and I'm catching up on the news. And as soon as I finish that, I then sit down, uh, either read a book or I do some journaling at that point in time. Uh, so, and then I'll come into the office now, which is at home. I'll spend about 20 minutes meditating. Uh, and when that's done, then I'll start to pre-plan my day. Uh, so all of these little things have just been little habits that I've learned along the way, uh, and just started to deploy in my life. And one of the most useful ones when it started, <laughs> and this is actually a funny story. Uh, again, like you, you drag me over the line kicking and screaming, right? Like I, I'm good from the perspective that I will do it. I'll do it to prove you wrong that it doesn't work, right? Yeah. Um, so it doesn't necessarily, that's why I'm such a, uh, why I think I learn so slowly because I probably come in from the wrong angle at times. And so I'm like, oh, this mantra shit won't make any difference to your life, you know. And uh, it was about trying to, to see your ego. And, and so I started going, you know what, I'm going to throw a few tests in here, test and measure. You know, I'm an analytical kind of boy. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. as I was going to bed out. reading my <laughs> – <laughs> that's it. And, and so as I was going to bed uh, reading my mantra, I, I'd read my mantras, which, you know, would be in and around abundance, in and around – you know, tomorrow morning you're going to wake up. You're going to have more energy than you've ever known possible. You're going to be happy. You're going to bounce out of bed. It is going to be the best day. Um, you know, that's where they started. And then I thought, well, bugger this. Look, let's just see if I can test it, right? You're going to wake up at two minutes. To, you're going to wake up two minutes before the alarm. You're going to bounce out of bed, blah, 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 blah. And so I started doing this. And fuck me if it didn't work. 
It uh-huh. absolutely worked. I started waking up two minutes before my alarm and, uh, and, and started and then I never stopped or I have stopped. But as soon as you stop, my life falls off the wagon. Yeah. Like you, you start feeling weird. You, you, you're, you don't have your faculties about your mind as much. Yeah. And you get into a rut and then you go, why am I in this rut? And you're like, oh, I've stopped doing all of the things you know, that help me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is sometimes the things that I look in business so often and you've got to hold the mirror up and, and it's easier to look at somebody else's business than it is your own. <laughs> but Isn't it? it's amazing with how much frequency the things that we do that make us successful, we stop doing them. Mm. Well, well, we've done them now. Should we, there should be something else to do, isn't there? Like, the, isn't there like, you know, uh, that made me successful, but there's obviously something more important to be more successful. No, no, it's the same thing, you know. It's the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. And, and we overcomplicate it, don't we? And, yeah. and so it's, I've been on this sort of learning curve of just do these basic things, do them all of the time because they actually improve the quality of your life, yeah. allow you to be more present, allow you to feel more joy in your life and allow you to quieten that mind that judges you and judges other people mm. uh, because that for me was the thing that was really stopping me from feeling happy on any level for most of my life because yeah. I was judging myself so much from the one year that I wasn't at uni when all of my friends were, that I felt like I was a failure and I felt like I was years behind and I would spend a lifetime catching up. Mm. That basically stayed throughout my whole life until until I could stop judging myself and blaming myself for not being than what I was. I always needed to be better than where I was. And uh, and as soon as it could start to quieten that voice, then the, the world started to change. Changing, mate. Uh, it's been... Uh, it's been- uh, a very uh, awesome conversation today, mate. Thank you for sharing the insights into your life and uh, I look forward to sharing many more on Wealth, Wine and Wisdom on Fridays. But I do have one last question for you today uh, on the Wealth Faculty. What is the true meaning of wealth to you, Andy Fenton? You know, I've asked that question of just about everybody I've ever met and uh uh, and the answer is different for everybody. Uh, so my personal belief uh, as to, to what true wealth is, um, if we step back, and I, and most people think of wealth as far as money is concerned, right? Uh, and I always relate it that money is just energy that you put out there. Uh, so it's you and I wake up in the morning, we do our morning routine, we go to work, we serve the people that we work with, we serve the people that... Uh, we work for, and that generates money. So that energy that we put out there comes back to us and it comes back to us as a form of money. And ultimately, I think that this is, and this is where it changes for everybody. Everybody is looking for freedom. Everybody is looking for freedom. Mm. But for everybody, freedom has a different definition. And so my, my version of freedom is going to be different from yours. And so for me that, you know, wealth is the ability to identify what freedom looks like uh, and be able to work towards that plan. And, uh, and if you're able to access your definition of freedom, then you're the wealthiest person in the world. Mate, great, uh, great definition. Andy Fenton, thanks for joining me on the podcast. You're welcome, mate. Good chat. Hey, thanks for joining us on The Wealth Faculty. Hope you enjoyed Make sure you subscribe where all good podcasts are found. You can find us there. And if you want to watch it, you can subscribe on YouTube, Positive Mentor TV. And until the next episode, take care. Bye for now.